All right, folks, we are live and in color. Uh, good evening. Call to order this workshop of the City Council for November 13th. Um, tonight's uh, exclusive item was to uh, have a more robust discussion uh, of the Barker uh, Dam uh, and the Lower Barker Dam relicensing. Um, we have a, 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 an expert guest with us and, and one on the phone. So what, what I'd like us to do, maybe we'll start with uh, Councillor Young and we'll uh, end uh, with our guest on the phone. Just uh, introduce uh, what part of the community uh, you represent. David Young, <coughs> City Councillor at large. Uh, Andy Titus, uh, City Council Ward 3. Bob Stone, City Council Ward 2. Adam Lee, City Council Ward 4. Randy Burns, outgoing City Councilor at large. Peter Creighton, City Manager. Uh, <laughs> Bjorn Lake, National Marine Fishery Service. Eric Cousins, Deputy Director of Economic and Community Development. And on the phone? National Park Service, Hydro Program Coordinator for the Northeast Region. We appreciate, uh, appreciate you joining us uh, by phone, uh, Kevin. Uh, the National Park Service um, has been a, a big supporter uh, and uh, a helping hand uh, in this process and others. Um, I know our friends from American Whitewater uh, were planning to join us uh, but have been tied up uh, with other obligations. Um, and Councillor Walker uh, is en route, um, but he is uh, traveling safely up the main turnpike, uh, and, and we want him here in one piece. So. Uh, with that, I'll uh, I'll turn the floor over. Oh, we've got one more guest. I'll, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Jordan Tate. I'm the chairperson of the Conservation Commission. Always make sure you speak into the mic so our friends at home can hear you too. Right. Do you want? Should I redo it? Sure. Okay. It's good, good practice. <laughs> yeah. Um, my name is Jordan Tate, and I'm the chairperson of the Conservation Commission. Great. Thanks for joining us. The floor is yours, Eric. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as uh, a lot of you know uh, from past discussions, uh, the Barker Mill Dam is up for relicensing. Uh, it's a process that happens every uh, 30 to 50 years in the past. It sounds like license terms may change to be 20 or 30 years uh, going forward, but uh, we're not certain of that at this point. Um, but it's a, it's a long period of time, at least a generation, that uh, these licenses uh, sit in place and govern what the uh, hydropower facilities are required to do as far as mitigating their impacts on the resource, mitigating their impacts on recreation, and um, giving back something for the use of a public resource to the people that are affected by, by its operation. Uh, it's different than a lot of business models. Uh, most of the businesses we see in town are uh, private businesses using private property to uh, earn an income, create jobs, and generate profit. Um, this uses uh, hydropower, uh, uses the public's resource, the public's river, uh, to uh, generate power for sale uh, for profit. Uh, so FERC has a process to try to mitigate impacts um, and take into account uh, the profit that's uh, derived from a public resource and uh, look for ways to, to minimize those impacts and even contribute back to the impacted community in some ways, uh, whether that's maintenance of a recreational resource providing better access to uh, the river uh, that's impacted or, or, or segmented by the hydropower facility. And uh, Barker Mill Dam uh, license expires in 2019. Uh, we started uh, this process or participating in the process uh, at the beginning uh, when the uh, facility filed their notice of intent to seek a new license in 2014. And we've had a number of check-ins uh, since then opportunities to submit comments and information about why this section of river is important to the community um, and what things could be done to mitigate impacts and provide better access for the public um, and it, it's it's bigger than um, you know it's not in a vacuum uh, better access to the rivers uh, and recreational opportunities uh, has a big impact on quality of life and is a strategy that uh, our comp plan and the council and, and the policymakers for the community have uh, considered important over that period of time in attracting new residents and you know, uh, giving people an opportunity to have high quality recreation and the resources that we have within our community. Uh, we have some unique resources. The uh, Little Androscoggin is one of them. And, uh, 
they can be important economic drivers when people make trips to enjoy them um, or even will pay a little more for a house to live near them if they like to frequent those those resources to uh, to date um, Kruger Energy has filed their draft license application uh, they've been required to do a number of uh, studies including a recreational flow study um, and we've had chances to comment on those all along the way um, there's a lot to learn about this process uh, the hydro facilities have consultants that go through this licensing process repeatedly and get paid fairly well to do that um, we've been fortunate uh, with the mayor's work at the land trust um, had already attracted interest from national agencies in this section of river for recreational potential uh, Kevin Mendick and the National Park Service um, had done some work on the Barker Mill Trail within the project area and uh, Bjorn Lake with NOAA uh, as well as uh, Department of Marine Fisheries um, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife at a state level all of those agencies have folks that try to address the interests of those agencies through the licensing process so they have an opportunity and have had opportunities to dedicate much more time to hydropower relicensing in general across the country or across the region that they cover um, and they've really been a great resource for us as municipal staff to try to understand the process make sure we know the formats and uh, we've worked hard to try to bring those stakeholders together uh, for discussions whether it's by phone or in person uh, throughout the process to find areas where our interests overlap and try to strengthen the case for uh, mitigating the impacts of the hydropower facility um, that uh, that's about it uh, what I was planning on doing for an introduction and uh, we have an opportunity to hear from Bjorn who does fisheries work uh, on hydro hydropower relicensing across New England anyways he focuses in New England uh, yeah the focus is New England but I do um, get the opportunity to work in the southeast and in Alaska as well so I I get to see a, a wide range of, of hydro facilities all across the country. I uh, thought it was a good opportunity to hear how this process may be similar to other facilities, what are the norms, what are the expectations, what are the outcomes, and uh, some other examples, and uh, talk specifically about the Barker Mill process and, and NOAA's work uh, through that process, but also an opportunity for the um, a couple of dams upstream, that is, no longer active that could be removed to improve fish passage uh, sooner as uh, it's likely that fish passage will be provided at the at the lower facilities so Bjorn uh, if you could uh, sure. take it from there you thank you fire up the PowerPoint so I can cue myself um, yeah so I'm a, I'm a fish passage engineer uh, I've been working at NOAA for just under two years now um, I like to consider myself a Mainer I did live in Bangor, Maine for about 15 years. Uh, worked for a consulting firm and got both of my graduate degrees at the University of Maine in Orono. Um, just wanted to uh, highlight who we are. So we're the National Marine Fisheries Service is our official name. Uh, we're also called uh, NOAA Fisheries as well. Uh, we're in the Department of Commerce. So we are much different than my, my colleague Kevin or the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, Wilbur Ross is our secretary and our bent is towards economics. And you may wonder why a, a fisheries person is in economics. Well at one time, the United States had a great fishery. And particularly Maine had a coastal community where much of our economics were derived from fisheries and, and that has decreased with time. Um, so we are in the Department of Commerce. Our interest is in uh, managing our coastal resources uh, and producing as many fish as we can so the folks that do go fishing in our coastal communities have something to harvest. Um, we're split into two divisions that are applicable to uh, the Lower Barker Project, Upper Barker Project, and uh, Littlefield Dam, which I'll talk about as well. Uh, and that is the Office of Habitat Conservation where I am housed and uh, we have two divisions a Habitat Protection Division which holds our hydropower program which is a national program that consults in all these relicensings that go on across the country 
Um, we are expecting in the next 10 to 15 years 230 license applications for a new license. Each one of these licenses is a def was a default of 30 years and now has changed to a default of 40 years. So that really highlights we get one crack at these in our career, in our lifetime essentially, uh, and so we need to consult and, and make sure we get the best that we can for our resource. Also in the ha Office of Habitat Conservation is our Restoration Center, and basically what they do is organize community-based restoration projects, and they run grant programs that can fund some of these projects that help restore fisheries. Uh, we have uh, numerous Restoration Center employees in my office in Gloucester, Massachusetts, and we also have a Restoration Center employee in our Orono field office. And then finally, the Protected Resources Division um, manages the endangered species. Uh, so in particular to this project, we do have Atlantic salmon, which are a listed species, a federally listed species, and so our Protected Resources Division has that management ob obligation. And you can, if you can go back here. It's a touchy guy. We have uh, various existing authorities that we work under. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act, which basically says any federal action that is completed. So a federal action could be federal dollars going into some sort of development or project, or it could literally be the Army Corps dredging Bay or, or whatever, it's some sort of federal action, they're required to consult with us and then we give recommendations to preserve the species. It's purely a recommendation. They can heed our recommendations or they can give reasons not to follow our recommendations. There's the Magnuson-Stevenson's Act, which is uh, how we manage our coastal fisheries. Uh, the Endangered Species Act, which I mentioned before. And then uh, the most important uh, one, the Federal Power Act. So Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act, basically it tells any federal action we have to give equal consideration between the development, the action, and our natural resources. Um, Magnuson-Stevens Act, uh, I highlighted the key one there, which is protecting essential fish habitats. So by definition, and in, in our management of Atlantic salmon, uh, the Little Androscoggin and the Androscoggin River are considered essential fish habitats and so we can re recommend on any federal action that you need to do X, Y, and Z to protect the species. And then there's the Endangered Species Act. Uh, obviously the objective is to prevent extinction. It's a three-step process. We have a third party, tells, tells us uh, NOAA Fisheries, make yourself useful. Um, we have this fish that we're concerned about and they petition us and say, you need to list the species. And then we have a bunch of scientists from around the country present their, their data, we evaluate the data, we make an assessment, and then we determine whether it should be listed or not listed. <coughs> if it is listed, we develop a recovery, recovery plan and designate critical habitat. The critical habitat for Atlantic salmon actually happens to be in Auburn Lewiston. Um, the Little Androscoggin River is not considered critical habitat it's important habitat, but it's not critical, and that means critical habitat is such deemed that is essential to recover the species. However, just downstream on the main stem of the Androscoggin is critical habitat, and that includes the Sabatis River, the Little River, and those and other tributaries. And then once we get the species back to where we think it's stable and growing, we can then delist the species. And NOAA Fisheries is the lead federal agency on, on Atlantic salmon. And most important is the Federal Power Act. Um, so non-federal dams, so these are dams that are not built by the federal government. We do have a lot of large dams, the Columbia Power System, Tennessee Valley, those are federal projects. That's not under the FERC jurisdiction. The FERC jurisdiction is for privately owned dams that require a license to operate. And as I mentioned, those licenses come around every 40 years now. Um, there are two types. There's licensed projects and exempt projects. So you can apply for an exemption, which means you don't have to go through the licensing process later on. 
basically you get your license and you can operate into in perpetuity and the only person looking over your shoulder will be the FERC. But most projects are licensed and require relicensing every 30, 40, 50 years. We have uh, a few sections under the Federal Power Act that give us authority, Section 10A and 10J, which again are like Maddox and Stevens and the Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act, just recommendations. We say you should do this, this is best for the species, and they can do it or not do it. Um, then there's the, the powerful mandate that we have with Section 18, and that is we can tell a licensee to build a fishway. And um, they can't not do it. <laughs> Basically, it is a mandate from Congress, and so when we say there is indeed a need for a fishway, they do have to build it. And then Section 30C involves the exempt projects, so those that aren't going for relicensing every 30, 40, 50 years, the ones that are um, asking for just one license to operate in perpetuity, we can designate terms and conditions on that license for the betterment of our species. So section 18, again, the key word is shall there. Um, if we do prescribe a fishway, they shall build it. Um, in the um, Energy P Power Act of 1992, we actually got a definition of what that means. It's a very broad definition, it includes operations, it includes all aspects of the facility that have an effect on fish passing that facility. And then finally, in the uh, Energy Power Act of 2005, um, gave the licensee the opportunity to do a trial type hearing, which is to basically take us to court. Um, so we can tell a licensee, you have to build a fishway, and they can challenge us on the material facts of that prescription. And um, they can't remove the mandate of building a fishway, they can just argue about what it is and how it should be built. Um, so we can say there are 50,000 salmon that you need to pass, and they would say that's not a fact, it's 47,500. It's, um, it's, it's a way to litigate us, and it's, um, it is what it is. <laughs> These are the two processes that the uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission does. There's the traditional licensing process and the um, integrated licensing process. FERC's default process is the integrated process. With Lower Parker, they um, applied to the commission to do the traditional licensing process. Um, we should have challenged that and intervened and said, no, you should do an integrated licensing process. And I don't expect you to read these boxes, but there's, there's some general things you should pick up from this. The traditional licensing process is much simpler. So you have the pre-filing stage, which is the top line of boxes, and the post-filing stage, which is the bottom boxes. The pre-filing stages are the steps before they submit their final license application. The final license application must be submitted two years prior to the expiration of the license. And then there's the post-filing. So once they file their, their, their license application, which is where Lower Barker is now, that's when we come in and say, you need to build a fishway, you need to give us recreational flows, you need to build a boat launch, all those things. So that's all in the second step. The difference between these two processes is that in the traditional licensing process, the commission stands back. So they start the process, they make sure the process is moving, but they don't intervene. So when we have disagreements about what kind of studies you need to do, what needs to happen, they just step back and make us figure it out between the consulting agencies, the local governments, and the licensee, and um, you don't always get what you want. So in this case, uh, NOAA Fisheries wanted some studies done that looked at how we would eventually pass fish at the facility, and we didn't get those studies because we didn't go through the ILP. During the ILP, FERC will actually come in and will have a study dispute resolution where they will get us, everybody in the same room and figure out this is what we're going to do. Um, so my recommendation going forward, if you do want to intervene in the Upper Barker project, you may want to ask for the ILP, and there's a whole public process for that. They'll send out their notification that they want to do TLP, 
you intervene, say, no, I think we need to do ILP. There's enough issues here that we want to intervene and we want the commission involved throughout the entire time. Can I ask a quick question? Hmm? You mentioned that Section 18 is the, the authority under which you can request the fishway or demand the fishway. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned that there was a part of the process that involved requests for a boat launch or recreational opportunities. Is that part of the Section 18 authority? What is that then? Um, that is uh, basically NEPA. Okay. So it's more akin to our recommendations. So it's, it's not something that's under the mandated authority of Section 18, it's something that's more of a, a rec recommendation right. under the 10A and 10J that you were talking about? Exactly. So in that case, FERC is the arbitrator in these proceedings. They make the final call. And FERC is essentially a group of commissioners picked by the president. Rarely does it ever get to that level. It would have to be a very um, big project with a lot of issues for it the actual commission to do it, but there's usually people underneath that make decisions. So they're the arbitrator. So when you say, I want a boat launch here, I want a whatever there, yep. FERC will say, I'm balancing energy production and local benefits. And if the FERC says, no, nah, you don't need a boat launch, yep. that's, it is what it is. It's Got like it. our recommendations. It's, it's a bit frustrating. Um, particular to the little Andreskog and, uh, mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, partic particularly to the uh, little Androscoggin, there are, are six species that NOAA Fisheries is interested in. The fish on the left are a group called alocines. The top two, alewife and blueback herring, collectively are river herring. And the bottom one is an American shad, all the same family. On the right, we have Atlantic salmon, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Sea lamprey, which are a PR nightmare for us, but they are an important ecosystem. They do perform important ecosystem functions. And then American eel, which is actually uh, quite a profitable fishery here in Maine. The, uh, the blueback herring or alewives are uh, fish that you can actively see during, the, during low water down there below the Barker Dam, uh, swimming up and down into the pools, and they're, they're, they're active there. And then I, I put together a few maps of the Androscoggin River showing where these fish used to be back in the day before uh, we built a bunch of dams. Um, so these are the alewife uh, habitats. Alewife spawn in ponds. Um, so they'll migrate up in the spring, spawn in the ponds, and their juveniles will come out in the fall. And you can see the Andros little Androscoggin is very important for these fish, extremely important. Uh, we estimate um, 1.7 million alewives can be produced in the Little Androscoggin watershed. So it's, it's, it's an important fishery for us. American shad and blueback herring both spawn within the main part of the river in flowing water. And their historical habitats were about the same distance. They were stopped at Lewiston Falls on the main stem and they got up probably to Bisco Falls in the Little Androscoggin River and spawned with all, within those habitats. So again, a lot of opportunity for these fish. American eel are very clever fish. They do a good job of getting over any barrier, including dams. And we have found American eel up in Ranger Lake all over the place. So these guys will crawl over things. So typically when we ask for assistance with American eel, we want them it's basically to make it a little bit easier for them because they, they do crawl over dams under certain conditions, but we'll build little ladders for them to get over. And it's usually fairly cheap for the licensee to do. And then, of course, there's the uh, Atlantic salmon. This was the historical range all the way through the Little Androscoggin River and all the way up into the Swift River. Um, and sea lamprey are presumed to have the same range as well. Unfor okay, and this, this picture here was a modeling exercise that our Protected Resources Division did to look at what was potential habitat in the watershed for spawning and rearing of Atlantic salmon. The dark purple is 50% of this area is suitable, and then the shades going down are 25% and 0 to 25%. So you can see there's quite a bit of available habitat if we can get the fish there. Question for you. <clears throat> Con considering the Deer Rips and Gulf Island dams are now sort of, they're on their way with their most latest 40 plus year license. 
does the, the probability of opening up more habitat through the Landerskagen improve opportunities to negotiate for passage with these projects, given that we're going to be in the 2050s before we would see it above Lewiston Falls? Uh, yes. So I, I think it, it highlights the importance of the Little Androscoggin. If we are going to get Atlantic salmon running in the Androscoggin again, I think the Little Andro is going to be the key role in that. Uh, the Little River to the right down the bottom and Sabatis have some habitat, but we're talking small, small numbers. So if we want to get salmon in the hundreds, then we definitely need the Little Androscoggin. Um, above Lewiston Falls, I think we need to evaluate when that project comes up where we are, because uh, salmon are hanging on by a thread right now, literally. We had no fish this year in this river um, past the Brunswick Fishway. So um, in 2026, we'll re evaluate that situation, and there may be opportunities upstream basically circumventing those projects, because you're right, we can't do anything about that till 2048. So we'll have to be uh, strategic about that. And unfortunately, this is the available habitat today. Um, we have the main stem up to Lewiston Falls, and for the most part, the Little River watershed is, is open. Um, but the rest of it's blocked. So we have a lot of work to do. And who's the dominant owner of that blockage? Uh, so for the Little Androscoggin, Kruger owns three of the four. Uh, the other is owned by Eagle Creek, and that's Hackett Mills. And on the main stem? On the main stem, uh, Brookfield owns everything except for Livermore Falls, Otis J, and Riley. And that's Eagle Creek as well. So just for, for the council's context, and there's been obviously some turnover since we had our disagreement um, with Lewiston on the water rights and the Lewiston Falls project and the importance of trying to work as one unit as Lewis and Auburn, um, given the importance of that project for next steps with Brookfield. Um, all of the turnover of local officials certainly puts us at a disadvantage already, uh, knowing as Eric pointed out that these hydro owners can afford their multi-million dollar consultants to protect their business interests, knowing that once they get over one hurdle, they've bought themselves 40 years. Um, so when you look at what's happened on the Kennebec, what's happened on the Penobscot, um, it's critically important that as a local government, certainly our staff are doing a great job, but that elected officials stay meaningfully engaged because when these windows close, they close until your kids or grandkids get another bite of the apple. Um, and this is just a slide showing why we care. Uh, the picture on the left is a picture of uh, Juvenile alewives in China Lake. Uh, the DMR stocks up that pond, and we are in a restoration process for that stream. Um, millions upon billions of juveniles will leave that pond every year. And those juveniles go out in the ocean and they feed the fish that Noah cares about uh, the recreational fishery of the stripers, um, cod, and other uh, ground fish in the, in the coastal environment. So they're very important to us. And also, they do provide some commercial fishery. Um, River herring are the preferred bait for lobstermen. Uh, that picture is at Vassalboro Pond, and those are lobstermen harvesting fish. Uh, Benton Falls on the Spasta Cook, uh, that, that town I think makes a couple ten thousand a year on the sale of, of alewives. And um, there's another project in Ellsworth where there's a, a significant alewife harvest where um, it boosts not only the local economy through the direct sale of fish, but it helps the lobstermen as well, which then boosts our lobster fishery as well. Could I just add, um, there is a stocking program at Taylor Pond as well um, for alewives. Uh, the fish are able to make their way downstream, but not back upstream. Um, and there's some research out there that suggests that they sequester nutrients and take them with them when they leave ponds like that too, that may uh, have an impact on water quality over time. Uh, helping to reduce the nutrient load in is there uh, they uh, isn't there uh, a cleaning function as well for for uh, some of these uh, species in some of these t uh, ponds uh, they are they're beneficial in terms of uh, algae and so on and so forth is that uh, 
Uh, there is uh, definitely anecdotal evidence here in Maine. Uh, many of the ponds, not all of the ponds in the Sebastopol watershed have um, seen dramatic increases in water quality and algal growth. Um, not all of them, though. So it's, you can't really, it's not black and white. There's a lot of things going on there. Um, but I know they were trying something in Sabatis Pond, which is a, you know, a pond that's under a little, it's in distress right, right now. And uh, I, I, don't, I can't remember the species that it's, was. It, uh, it is alewife, so that alewife is also and, stocked yeah. by uh, DMR. Is that continuing, or is that did that they terminate that project? That they're they're, st they're going to continue with that. Um, our restoration center is active in the Sabatis River. We did hit a hurdle with a DOT bridge that needs replacement, and there's some um, issues with some set sediments behind the first dam. And if they if this bridge gets replaced, it may alleviate that sediment issue. If that's the case, then we, we do anticipate seeing fish passage throughout that watershed. Um, this is a uh, graphic of the work ahead of us uh, on the Little Androscoggin, starting at Lower Barker and then going up to Bisco Falls. Um, not all of these are, are licensed federal projects, um, but you'll see that we have 52 miles of river and we're producing 4.3 megawatts of electricity. Um, 4.3 megawatts of electricity can be produced by three windmills. Um, so, you know, it, it's a lot of habitat we're losing for not a lot of energy benefit. Okay, can you compare that to the Monty as an example? Uh, I, th I don't even remember what that is, but it's, yeah, it's a lot more. So, yeah, you go to Warumbo, the Jeff Scott, Monty, Brunswick, uh, they're still considered small by FERC. Um, anything under 100 megawatts is small compared to FERC. So these are what FERC considers micro hydro. Um, and for our fish species, it doesn't matter if it's a five foot tall dam or a 500 foot tall dam, they can't get past it. So um, I know there's gotta be some equal consideration here between uh, your, your power benefits. So let's specifically talk about the Lower Barker project. On the left, you see an aerial view of the dam and what is uh, integral to this project and why it's so controversial is the bypass reach and then the powerhouse. You know the powerhouse is next to actual Barker Mill on the right and the dam's on the left. Um, so basically you're, you're moving a big chunk of the river flow around this bypass. And this has major considerations not only for the recreation in the bypass but as major considerations for our fish. So we're in the process of preparing our prescription and our recommendations for this license. Our EFH recommendation will be to have 175 minimum CFS through the bypass year round. Um, we will also, because it's directly related to Atlantic salmon, which is a managed fisheries under the Magnuson Stevenson Act, we will also recommend upstream and downstream passage for Atlantic salmon. Our protected resources will do their own consultation uh, which is to be determined. And then through the Federal Power Act, our 10J recommendation will once again be 175 uh, minimum bypass flow year round. And then our Section 18 prescription will include downstream passage and protection measures. Right now, the fish go through the turbines or over the dam. Uh, it's, neither of those are very safe. And upstream passage for American eel upstream passage for anadromous species, that is Atlantic salmon, the Olocenes, and 175 minimum bypass flow in the bypass reach during the fish passage season. And the reason we're doing that is we're not convinced that 100 CFS is enough water for fish to get from the powerhouse to the dam. And we're, if we build a fishway, it's going to be at the dam because it would be <laughs> very difficult to build a fishway at the powerhouse and then have the fish go up the road <laughs> to above the dam. So we'd have to build the fishway at the dam. Um, it's a very difficult site for fishway construction. And just as a matter of scale right now, the current license requires 20 cubic feet per second. So the current license is, is inadequate to pass fish. There have been observances of fish literally out of water by the dam. 
I, I've been down there uh, getting ready for a meeting a couple of years ago, and there were, you know, owl wives swapping around on the rocks. I think the level dropped fairly quickly, and the, the birds were having a field day down there, but the owl waves were having, having a bad day. So, uh, just a quick question. So uh, you're saying those uh, under Section 18, uh, can you mandate that flow? Yes. Okay. So that's so that. That's why I put that definition up there, which is very broad. Is that we can actually mandate an operation. Um, another example would be, eels are fairly easy to get above dams, as I mentioned, but they migrate to the Sargasso Sea in the Atlantic Ocean to spawn, and when they do that, they're large. You know, eels can get four feet in length. Um, and they don't do well with turbines. <laughs> uh, and, and so oftentimes we will uh, require a licensee to shut down at night, and then the fish will then pass over the dam because they actually prefer to move at night anyway. So that would be another example of a fishway, but it's just an operation change. Um, so this picture is provided by Eric. It is a alewife in the bypass at Lower Barker uh, that didn't have a good day. And we can use this as part of our justification. So if they do challenge us the material fact of building a fishway, this will be our response, is that we've documented fish there. We have fishway counts at Rumbo for the past 18 years, uh, which is the lower the dam below us. And this year, during the fish passage season, I went out there with a GoPro, randomly stuck it in a pool below the dam, and actually saw a school of alewife swimming around. So they're there every year and they're having a hard time getting over the dam. And our justifications for the flow is actually data taken directly from their license application. This is uh, habitat suitability. So the percentage of maximum habitat you can have in the bypass. And you can see at, at 175 CFS, um, that maximizes the habitat for Atlantic salmon and then also for the inland fisheries of uh, brown trout and rainbow trout, which would really help the recreational fishery as well. Um, finally, on Lower Barker, this is analysis that I have done. This is estimated. I don't know this, um, but this is data taken from their license application, their annual generation on the left y-axis in megawatt hours per year, and on the right axis, their annual estimated revenue. Again, this is not published data. But what I do is I go to ISO New England, which is public data, which is the wholesale market for energy. And then I take that data and I basically multiply it out. That energy data is very seasonal. So energy prices in winter are very high here. And then energy prices in the summer are a little bit lower. So this actually takes that into account so I can figure out what their actual annual revenue might be. And this is revenue, this isn't profit. In their final license application, they state that their um, operation and maintenance costs are about $200,000 a year, and that includes taxes, administration costs, all that stuff. Um, so that's an average. When they have good years, obviously they're paying more taxes, and bad years are paying less taxes. But if you just look at the $200,000 mark there on the y-axis on the right, um, they've made a decent profit four out of the last 10 years. And in 2016, it actually lost quite a bit of money. Um, what does this have to do with fisheries? Nothing. But when I ask, or when we, not I, when we ask for a fishway, that costs a lot of money. Probably going to cost in the range of three to five million to build a fishway for, with all the bells and whistles that will be necessary. Added on to that, the yearly operation and maintenance of that fishway people counting fish, people making sure it's working in operating order, the flows it takes to operate that fishway, it, it's expensive, and I understand that. And it's hard for a business, but it is what it is. It's, they have to mitigate for the effects on the resource. And so when I take that into account, that kind of capital investment, I get very nervous about the ability of a licensee to actually pay for it. In some cases, they can use their portfolio to subsidize certain projects to get things done. Um, but I am dealing with other projects. Right now, I'm dealing with a project in the Hudson River where energy prices dropped, and they are not doing 
what they agreed to do as far as fishways. And so this just highlights one of our concerns going into this, but we still need to, to, to push forward. Before you change, maybe Bjorn or, or Eric can, can speak to, it's my understanding that separate from the application, they've put forward some improvements, a new, uh, a new turbine um, that can operate at lower flows that may help with profitability as well as a potential energy contract with another state for green energy credits. Can you talk about how that influences, I mean, what we're seeing here may not be what we would see on the other side based on their changes? It most likely they'll have much higher minimum flows in the bypass reach, which will reduce the flows that are available to power generation. Um, they are looking at using tax credits in a different state um, with a power purchase agreement to help fund a new turbine that would increase the amount of time that they could generate in their they are saying that that would allow them to increase the profitability of the facility. Um, but the last I had kind of heard that was before we started talking about minimum flows for fish passage and other things. Um, so it, I think it's very much up in the air whether or not the project can support its own existence in the long term uh, with the revenues that it generates. Yes, go ahead. Question. Be sure to speak Mr. into the mic. Very, <coughs> very basic question and others may know the answer and I hope you do. What happens if uh, the requirements that are set under the license uh, for the dam, for example, the fishway and so on and so forth, are such that the, it's not a viable enterprise? What happens to that dam at that point in time? Uh, there's no clear path. Um, the Commission has uh, a, f a few policies that it's sent, when I say Commission, FERC, has put out a few policies over the years. Um, in some cases, like a, a great case would be here on the Kennebec in Maine, the Edwards Dam group was decided to be not economically viable, and the Commission actually required them to remove the dam. Uh, there are a lot more cases where the Commission says it's it's not a viable project, and we're just not going to relicense it. Um, and in that case, the commission may or may not require dam removal. It may just require that they shutter the hydroelectric facility and then figure out who's going to own the dam post-license. And a follow-up <clears throat> a follow-up question. Let's say a dam was ordered, demolished, removed. What impact does that have on that on the river? Um, you know, when when the dam is no longer there, uh, I know it's happened in Augusta. Basically, it, the river just returns to its natural state. Uh, is that what happens at, for the Little Andro at yes. this point? And what impact would that have on our plans, uh, on the on the city's potential plans? for kayaking and so on and so forth? I think uh, you would have basically a naturally flowing river. So instead of uh, a recreationist who wants to figure out what the flow in the river, instead of calling the licensee, they'll look at the USGS stream gauge and they'll decide whether or not they want to recreate. Um, the, the bypass flow does give you control. So if if you were able to, and again, it's very hard through the licensing process to get exactly what you want, if you were able to negotiate a flow, a recreational flow on a set schedule, that's what is what it is. So as long as the water is in the river, the licensee will provide it. But, um, so it gives you a little bit more control. Um, so that, that, I mean, that's an option. But um, what you would get if you remove the dam would be all the other projects in the river, Upper, Hackett Mills, uh, Marcal, are all run of river. So they don't store water. None of them provide flood benefits. And so basically, you get what the river gives you. Thank you. It, when the, the folks from American Whitewater may be able to speak more to it, but I know when they had their flow test, um, uh, there were some comments made about what, what the experience might be like if it were its natural 
course. And the reality is it's, it's, it's seasonal it's, it's because it is run of river, you know, during runoff and peak water times. But assuming the gauging was available, it's one of the things that Eric's put in as a request. Even if we had some managed flows, there is no way right now to know when we would have that because the gauging is coming from, I think, South Paris. So uh, what's the, Eric, you might be able to answer this. Um, what's our target flow for recreation, like vis-a-vis -vis this uh, 175 cubic feet? So our focus has been um, with the existing conditions, a dam in place, uh, providing better recreational access and providing better information to the public to make decisions about when to access the river. Um, and also providing something to help maintain the trails that the city and the Androscoggin Land Trust have already uh, worked to um, improve and maintain over the years, mostly the land trust. Um, we, we didn't take a strong position on the removal of the dam. Um, I, I don't think any of the things that the city is asking for in the licensing process have a major impact on whether or not the facility is profitable. Um, the fisheries passage, I think, has the biggest impact on whether or not that, that facility is viable. Um, and, uh, you know, we took the position basically that we think all options should be looked at uh, when it comes to mitigating the impacts, but um, it was more limited to recreation and helping maintain recreational access. Sure. So just in the context of recreation, though, is there some sense of uh, how much water we need flowing in order for it to be useful for recreation, it was higher than that. Yeah, it was. It was higher. The uh, the minimum passage uh, fish passage 175 CFS that's being requested or uh, recommended um, does not provide a high quality recreational experience. Okay. Uh, but there are a lot of times during the year where that's all that's available, or there's even less than that available. Sure. Um, I think it was uh, it was up in the 600 to 800 uh, cubic feet per second that people started to have an enjoyable sort of white water, fast water paddling experience. And uh, as you go down from there, it becomes a little more novice and up from there might provide a high quality expert uh, over a thousand cubic feet per second, but it hasn't, hasn't been tested. Right. I was just trying to get a sense of that scale. Thanks. Yeah, so I think that would imply that you would want most of the river to be running through the bypass for it to be uh, a reliable recreational source for you. And a, a dam removal would more than double that natural flowing river experience as far as a, a whitewater run at high water. Um, so moving up to the Upper Barker project, um, our plan going forward, and again we haven't received the pre-application document yet, but we are uh, planning on intervening on this process as well. Uh, it's much simpler, there is no bypass reach here. Uh, it's a run of river facility. Uh, the dam, to my knowledge, is in relatively good shape, um, unlike Lower Barker. And so basically what we'd be looking at is, is just fish passage. Um, it's a little bit more clear cut. They, they do actually have a downstream, what I would consider a downstream fishway now. It's, it's just not very uh, effective. It's often clogged with uh, wood and debris and whatnot. So um, come 2018, when the pad comes out, we'll be intervening and starting the process. Um, and if the city cho so chooses, then you know, we'll hopefully work together on that project as well. And then finally, um, also in, in the city of Auburn is- it, Just a, one, one for, for context, we often look at the falls here um, on, across the Longley Bridge and note the drop there. The, the drop on the, the Little Androscoggin from when it was natural from above the upper Barker to below the lower, it's actually a, a greater drop than what you have here. Um, just didn't have the, sort of the terrain to give you the potential to build the canals in the mill district, but it's actually a greater drop on the little Androscoggin than it is here on the Androscoggin. And then uh, finally in the city of Auburn is a, a decommissioned hydroelectric facility called Littlefield Dam. So this would be an example where uh, the facility lost its license, was decommissioned, and uh, basically the commission just let it rot in the river. And so it's still there. Um, it's a public safety hazard. It 
performs no function. It creates excess erosion. Um, it's a problem. And, you know, NOAA Fisheries has a, a strong interest in, in removing this lump of, lump of concrete out of the river. And our hope is that we can have a partner in the city of Auburn in, in, in taking care of that. It is owned by the golf course there. Um, their owner is amenable to whatever, as long as he's not paying for it, which is understandable. Um, and I, I think, though it is a lot of concrete and would be a fair amount of construction work, I, I think it's something that would be attractive and there would be plenty of funding sources to assist the city if, if it did want to go after this project and improve um, the recreation in this stretch of the river as well. Um, I continue to provide funding opportunities and unfortunately, our restoration center doesn't have a funding opportunity next year. Um, but there is upcoming year of the salmon in 2019, which may be an opportunity. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, NRCS, all have funding opportunities. I sent an opportunity to Eric this morning. Um, the city of Auburn is perfectly set up to administer this because you have the infrastructure, you have an engineering department. You have people who know how to operate grants. So if the city was interested, I think there's a good partnership here. Um, and clearly, it's a nice stretch of river. You can improve boating and recreation in this stretch of river as well. Uh, it was stocked by IFNW with uh, trout in the past. They no longer do it. Um, but I'm sure they'd be willing to, to work with us as well. So I just have a question about how that, what that looks like, I guess, from a, a management standpoint. Are there cases where you would take a grant like that and hire an outside firm that's familiar with dam management to work for you through that process and fund it through the grant, or would it be in-house engineering staff? I think in, the, I think in this case it is potentially possible to do it with in-house engineering staff. Um, I would recommend getting it surveyed professionally. I don't know if the city has that, um, but as far as you know, putting some sheets together, this is just demolition. So you just got to get the equipment in and, and pull the stuff out. I mean, it's not complicated engineering. Um, you would probably need to hire consulting firms to do uh, natural resource assessments, wetland delineations to make sure that you could permit the project. But I don't consider this uh, building a rocket ship. <laughs> You know, you, you crawl your equipment in, you break it up, and you pull it out. Um, it's pretty simple. In, in terms of, you mentioned 2019 as a potential target year to seek potential federal funding as a partnership. And I know, uh, Kevin, you still there? Just uh, with the uh, hotel road, oh, hotel road cross. Yes, I'm here. I was on mute. All right. Um, a lot of time and energy has been spent on the Androscoggin for recreation planning fisheries work, land and water trail planning, um, and the Little Androscoggin, because of the, the, bigger, <laughs> the bigger brother, had really not seen that. And if, if we're thinking of that kind of lead time, I, I would wonder whether you, Bjorn, or you, Kevin, or even Eric, um, have thoughts on a, on a kind of process that sort of takes what we're doing right now at the, at the confluence in New Auburn and sort of extends it upstream and says, you know, let's look at a five-mile section or a four-mile section of the <coughs> river where are the existing access points? Where would the portage opportunities be? Where would you want to have bank fishing? To sort of orient going after this kind of opportunity and what that would mean. We're going to make improvements there, and we're going to partner with the owner of Martindale and take a headache, for example, out of, uh, uh, out of his hands. What does it look like to create better access? I know a couple of years ago, the city took ownership of a piece of land just downstream um, of Martindale. Um, is the owner open to opportunities, or would we do that on the other shore? That, that kind of planning may help position and mobilize community support so we could take full advantage of pursuing something in 2019. So I don't, whether it's, I don't know if it's Rivers and Trails Conservation Assistance, again, for just a little Androscoggin, or if there's other programs that might help bring in some planning support um, to do that kind of work in advance. I, we have a lot of priorities right now um, that we're having a hard time keeping up with. <laughs> Uh, I think that could be important and, and worthwhile work. Um, I guess my first thought would be to see is there a way to have a partner like the Land Trust right. maybe manage a process like that. 
but I mean, it could be very worthwhile work. And I, and I, I don't raise it to suggest that, that the city take it on, but if, if resources are identified, you know, maybe it's a conservation commission, land trust partnership, the land trust has always found really strong success. If the city is there with them as a partner, their ability to draw down, whether it's foundation or state or federal resources seems to be greater when the cities are standing with them, and that allows a dedicated partner to execute that while staff have other competing priorities that they have to deal with besides just river work. And the, the land trust has done an outstanding job of keeping a, an active relationship with the actual property owner along that stretch of river and keeping public access to the trail um, during times when the city probably couldn't have been in a position to do what they've done in keeping that open to the public. Unless the Chamber of Commerce wants to do it. It, it, it's not likely you'll see that kind of uh, input from the from the power company from Kruger. Um, you know, one one of the things that we've been seeing in the relicensing process, I've I've been involved in this arena for about 25 years. Um, you know, NPS's focus is mostly on public access and recreation aesthetics and, and where possible land land conservation. Um, but, you know, we used to have, uh, you know, Central Maine Power, Green Mountain Power, Connecticut Light and Power. We used to have a lot of local uh, power companies. Uh, so they were part of the community, whereas now you're seeing a much more removed ownership. You only have a handful of, of hydro projects, a, pretty, a handful of companies that own most of the projects in the Northeast. So they've really become removed from the communities, and they're just looking at, at the uh, – at the numbers, um, I, and I, I think that's reflected in the challenges that we've collectively had regarding uh, the whitewater boating uh, flow study, uh, just in terms of, of getting them to agree to do the study. Uh, it, it took quite a while. Uh, FERC has asked for, you know, as of October 3rd, FERC still doesn't have the, the final report from the whitewater study, gave them until November and as far as I can see on the FERC dock and nothing's been, nothing's been filed. Um, uh, you know, I guess in terms of, at this point in the process, um, FERC's issued their what's called Ready for Environmental Analysis Notice. They basically said the license has been accepted for filing. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they have every piece of information they need, such as the White Water uh, Boating uh, Study Report. Um, so FERC noticed that the license was accepted for filing the end of June. Maine Division of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, American White Water, Water and DOI intervened. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service filed additional comments uh, on their scoping document in September because we had a scoping meeting at the end of, of uh, August. I think a number of us were, uh, were there. Um, so FERC has issued their, their REA notice again the end of uh, October and, and comments, this is basically comments on the final license application uh, would be due December 29th. Um, as part of those comments, Fish and Wildlife Service, and again, Antonio um, Todd Levino is sorry he couldn't make it tonight. Um, I can't speak technically for him, um, but I know uh, Fish and Wildlife will be developing Section 18 uh, fishway prescriptions downstream will be largely in line, in line with what you're seeing from, uh, from National Marine uh, Fisheries Service. Um, we also didn't take a position on, on, uh, on dam removal on, on, this, on this project. Um, and I, I know there's been some discussion about the Upper Barker Dam and the relicensing process. It's not quite contemporaneous with this one. Um, unfortunately, FERC takes a kind of narrow view regarding other projects on the same River in terms of timing, so unless the current licensee would agree, to either an extended term or file for relicensing early, FERC can't really force that decision. That's why we end up with some of these disjointed processes, especially when you have different uh, different owners. That can be that can be very very challenging. Um, You know, I mean, there's there's also another process that's been going on uh, with the licensee proposing to put a new minimum flow turbine in. Uh, they originally wanted that to be handled under maintenance. Uh, FERC said they needed 
considerably more information. They filed more information. FERC then said, no, I'm sorry. This is not maintenance. This has to be considered in the context of the current relicensing. So that was evaluated in, in, the, uh, in, in the final application. So the scoping document does incorporate the, that information. Um, so it, at least we know what the, what the minimum flow may, may do, but again, it doesn't provide adequate flow for, uh, for recreation. Um, I, I, you know, my, not, to be, not to play the devil's advocate, but I think in terms of what FERC may reasonably require uh, would be some type of, uh, you know, there may be one or two scheduled uh, releases during the, during the summer months uh, at a 600 to 800 range. Uh, FERC may uh, also require considerably better uh, information to and from the public. Uh, you know, the old version was like a flow phone. People could call up uh, a, no a dedicated number. Uh, now with the, the internet, they can post. Uh, the company could have, a, you know, has a website. Many companies do and have a website. Uh, you can look online. You can see exactly when they're when they're going to have uh, flows, when ri natural river conditions might provide spilling and the type of recreation flows that, that uh, boaters might want to see. Um, Bjorn, in your experience, is there a municipality that you've worked with that you think would be a good case study for us or a good model in terms of uh, the issues that you've talked about this evening? Uh, well, I think th there are a lot of examples. Uh, one that's going on right now is actually uh, the town of Kennebunk um, on the Malsum River um, actually owned uh, three hydro facilities that were licensed. Um, they've spent a lot of time and effort uh, determining that those projects are no longer economically viable and actually costing the taxpayer more than energy that they were producing. Um, so they can, I'm sure, share some horror stories with you. Um, it, it's, it's not always ubiquitous that, that the towns get involved. Um, it really, it really depends on where you are. Um, right now, we're in a, a licensing process in Massachusetts, um, town of Montague. Um, I'm trying to remember the other towns' names. Um, Turner's Falls project. Uh, they have about a mile-long bypass reach, which at times has zero flow in it. <laughs> Um, and I, Bob, Bob Nastor at White, American Whitewater is also engaged in that. So um, they also have some impoundment issues where they have an impoundment that fluctuates up to nine feet that's caused uh, erosion issues on people's land. Um, so there, there are some towns there that probably could. Uh, They're doing some economic development around that section of the river. Mm -hmm. I think the big difference between a project like that and Lower Barker is that um, that produces a lot of electricity. And it also has a, a pump storage project, which is not to get into the engineering details, but essentially is, is a water battery that produces two thirds of New England's battery capacity. So yeah, that, a, that's a that's a storage project at Northfield Mountain. Yeah, so that's a that's a difficult, um, it's a political situation when you're when you're talking about the regional stability of electrical grids. So it's not always apples to apples, um, but certainly that those towns have been quite a bit uh, engaged. Um, right, and you know we've we've seen a lot of projects. You know, FERC may look at these as micro hydro in some cases, but it's not unusual for a full panoply of issues to be present in a very small project in terms of megawatts uh, compared to a very large project in terms of, uh, in, in terms of megawatts. You know, and this one clearly has a lot of these, a lot of these types of issues. Um, I, I think the situation on the lower Musam, you have one of the few remaining municipal uh, light companies, and they did decide 
uh, that it was not economic to, to relicense the project and go through the inevitable fish passage requirements. Um, so they proposed to, I guess, decommission the project, and there could be some, there could be removal to some extent of one, two, or all three of those dams. But another organization has been formed uh, called Save the Moose Sam, and what they are trying to do is they are trying to file an application to relicense the project. So that's going to be a fairly complicated situation, but it does, you know, some of the same issues have or will be evaluated in terms of, well, what happens when you remove the dam? Uh, what are the impacts on, on adjacent property owners who've had a, uh, you know, effectively a pond for 100 years uh, and public access uh, issues? Uh, so, yeah, there, there's, there's a lot to, to consider, as Jordan has, has said. And there, there may also be some information that the uh, uh, Kennebunk put together that might be germane, uh, germane here because it did do an evaluation of you know, what would happen under a dam removal scenario. Other questions or comments from counselors from our Conservation Commission? Any questions? So I, I get this is uh, kind of an organization, and I, I, this is kind of a drum I've been beating for most of the term. But it, you know, and Eric, you alluded to this that uh, there's a distinct capacity issue when it comes to being able to manage. You know, there, there's a lot of uh, you know we just we just kind of worked through three different dam projects in the course of this conversation. That's obviously a significant amount of of work, staff time organization um, and management is there this is an open question and one that will probably have to be handled by the next council but I, I think we need to ask ourselves what's the most efficient way that we can make sure that we have the right stakeholders at the table to be able to come up with as comprehensive of a strategy as possible and um, and I'm not sure if if we're there it's, it's good to see everyone around this table having this discussion but Moving forward, I, I think it's it's worth asking. You know, uh, you know, does it look like a work group? Does it look like something that's that's more cohesive with a, a more clearly defined goal um, that is pulling in the various uh, pieces of this that need to be working together in, in consort, but delegating the responsibility so that we can actually stay on top of this. I I think um, the schedule of relicensings. Uh, sort of makes it manageable that they are spread out over a long period of time. Uh, we've been more engaged in the relicensing process at the, the lower Barker, I think, than most communities ever get engaged in this process, um, at least locally. Uh, we, I've been asked to speak at GrowSmart uh, about municipal engagement in the licensing process. I think we are more engaged than most communities. A lot of these licensing processes, I think, happen in other communities without the community ever putting together comments and talking to the elected officials. Um, so I, I, I think that's I think that's manageable. But there may, depending on how the each process goes, there may be a point in time where we need some legal assistance. Um, I guess that would be my suggested approach, but to, to provide resource, legal resources as needed um, at some you know, reasonable level um, if we do need them. And I think in this licensing process, if that's going to be necessary, that's coming up in the next year. year. I would actually add on to what, what Eric said, having been around this stuff since 2006 when we were dealing with deer ribs in Gulf Island. Um, <clears throat> we probably have a good decade plus of work still ahead of us. Um, it's not just these processes, but the continued engagement around trails, water access, having activities. You know, we, we are still a post-industrial community that has not fully embraced the river. Um, a lot has changed in the last decade. The Land Trust has done great work. The city has partnered to do that. Um, I would go so far as to say that the city ought to consider a formal partnership with the land trust. When you think about the groups that we provide thousands of dollars to to host an art walk event or event X, Y, or Z, what the land trust has brought in terms of private 
dollars in activity to the riverfront. If you want to have a group that can convene stakeholders um, and to be moving and keeping an eye on very specific projects, I think that's the kind of public-private partnership that could help carry this. It would be a, a, it's a lot less expensive to partner with the land trust for facilitation than to use public employees. Um, and it also allows someone who's an organization who, where it's completely in their wheelhouse to focus on that issue to engage on it. And the, the, op the opportunity to bring in philanthropic dollars to these two rivers and these communities remains high. Um, and the more we partner with NGOs like the Land Trust, and there are others, um, I think the better off we're going to be. So I'd, I, I think that navigating the next council, I would, I would, they asked for my recommendation, I'd recommend they navigate some partnership, identify a multi-year partnership, send some benchmarks around convening partners and reporting back. Uh, and I think that would go a long way to not only keeping Lower and Upper Barker on track, but <clears throat> projects like Littlefield and others um, would start to gain their own momentum, as opposed to, you know, a big pressing issue emerging that really requires Eric or or Mike or Doug's attention that could divert from this. You've got someone who's solely focused. That's. Thank you. Um, you know, when we first started hearing about this project a couple of years ago, um, I still have been confused because it is a very complicated process. But I think from my standpoint and from what we should be doing as a city is what do, we, what do we want to get out of this? What's our goal? And I don't know that we've clearly defined that. I, tonight I'm hearing that maybe if there's going to be a multi-million dollar requirement for the, the dam owners to, to do, <coughs> and if they don't do it, does the dam become decommissioned? Um, so what do we do then if the dam is removed? I've heard potentially spending a lot of money to remove an upstream dam already. I've heard we need council in the next year or two because we can't figure it all out. And I'd like to know if you know this council, maybe not this council, but the next council's got to set the goals. What what is it? If it's economic development, how much are we willing to invest in down that goal? If it's conservation, how much are we willing to invest in, uh, towards that goal? So I'm thinking what we're doing right now is we're just <coughs> spending a lot of time and money without a real clear goal. And I'd like to see what that what the potential is. Now, what if the dam did go away? What would that mean to the recreational opportunities? Or is it just going to be, you know, for conservation or for the beauty of the river and development and, um, and walking trails and not recreation? I think those are the questions that the council needs to have because this is very complicated. How we save the fish, how we have them give them better access, that's a complicated issue that I support in a way, but if that's one of the goals, we want to know that too. You talk about the shoreline of these ponds um, along the river. The, the golf course was uh, identified as one of the, the abutters. Are there multiple abutters uh, along the stretch? Golf course is an abutter to the river at the Littlefield Dam, so well above the uh, lower and upper Barker projects. How about the lower Barker, the, the pond that's there? Most the multiple of, abutters? Most of the abutting property owner is a single owner that allows, uh, through a license, allows recreational access through the land trust. Um, it is, uh, it's in a family trust now. The, uh, the owner has, has passed away. So uh, if the, the dam is no longer there, it, uh, the river is much smaller, then, then they would own actually more land? I, I believe they would. They actually own the land that the dam sits on as well and lease that to the, the power company. But I'm, I would be concerned if anybody that's, that has uh, property that have a shoreline, so to speak. It's uh, not, it doesn't really function. There, there really isn't <coughs> a, an impoundment per, per se on, on this. It's a fairly narrow section, so I wouldn't, unlike Gulf Island Dam, if you took out that dam and went back to the original river channel, there really hasn't been a great alteration of the river channel with these projects, with the lower and upper Barker. So it's, uh, so it'd be about this, well, actually it'd be a much smaller stream if it's not, uh, if it isn't a pool behind it. it if would, somebody bought a piece of property and they have, they look at it, this is their shoreline, they put a boat in or something. If we, if we drain the swamp, so to speak, uh, then, uh, they're going to have, uh, you know, dry land, or maybe a little stream. They they might not like that. In this facility, though, the the width doesn't change that much. It's it's fairly steep walled. Uh, mm -hmm. The depth and the speed at which the water moves would change substantially. But uh, yeah. it would the 
width wouldn't move, you know, hundreds of yards away from their house because um, it's but not that wide. But it has a it has a value. I mean, yep. I would hope that these people weigh in on what we might have determined here, what we push for. The, you know, they they might uh, say, well, they're going to have a little. The shoreline is going to be further away. The beach is going to be much bigger. Maybe that'd be a be a good thing. I don't know. Uh, this has been very informative. Uh, I want to thank uh, thank you for uh, uh, providing this information. I think that <clears throat> I'm, I, well, definitely, uh, Andy's reading my mind because I have the same concern as to what is our ultimate goal. And uh, you know, if you don't have a goal, you're never going to reach it. So <clears throat> I think one of the things that uh, we, with your <laughs> recommendation. Uh, Mr. Mayor, is uh, I think the ALT would be a, an excellent partner with the city to kind of bring some energy into the thing and come up with a plan for this stretch of river. Uh, I play at that golf course, and uh, I'm I play about 90 rounds a year, and walk so I walk that stretch, and there's a surprising amount of recreation in there that's happening now that. Uh, you know, you might not realize a lot of boating, uh, not a lot of kayaking, uh, but and a lot of fishing. Uh, it, it, it's, in the summer, it's hard. You'd be hard pressed to drive by that bridge on uh, what is it, Hotel Road, and not see three or four uh, vehicles in there uh, and people fishing. So there's got to be some good fishing in there. Um, but I, I, I. You know, when you build a fire station, you have a plan. This is what we've got to end up with, a, a fire station. Uh, we don't really know what we're going to end up with here. And it's not a simple question to answer. It's, uh, there's a lot of possibilities. Um, and uh, so, but I think one of the things we can be doing in parallel to the regulatory activities and so on and so forth, and looking at Littlefield. I think Littlefield's a fairly quick home run that uh, the city should pursue, uh, because that's a nice little waterfall there, and uh, it's, it's near, the, near the golf course. Uh, you know, I, I just, I think we could be coming up with, okay, what do we want to do with that stretch of the river from uh, the hotel road down t into uh, New Auburn? What is the overall plan? Is maybe bike paths along, along it, uh, so on and so forth? Because even if the dams get taken out, it's still going to be scenic. It's a scenic area in there. Very wild, a lot of wildlife. And uh, uh, so uh, I would urge that, and I think we've come a little bit of the way in two years, but we need to know, we need to come up with a master plan for for that uh, that area, and uh, that can be done, I think, with a lot of citizen engagement and so on and so forth, and come up with some gross budget as to what this thing. Gross budget, I don't even no, no, no. <laughs> Macro budget, I guess, or oh, whatever, an overall budget as to what you know the city is willing to put into that uh, project. So but before we go to Councilor Lee, I, I just want I want to challenge that the last comment you made about. You were saying a, sort of a gross budget, as in the sort of macro level, what, what order of magnitude resources then you concluded with for the city to put in. Um, this, is, this does not have to be a city of Auburn project, just like when we were talking about the canals five years ago. It didn't have to be a Lewis and Auburn funded project. There are outside interests, foundations, state and federal resources that are available and have wanted to invest in a community that believed in its resource given where we've come from. So that there's a dynamic here where, and Andy's gonna, his finger, his toenails are gonna curl up. They already are. Don't <laughs> think about, don't let money limit your vision because a strong vision will attract capital. That doesn't mean there's a blank check from the city. And whether it's the little Androscog in the canals or the main stem, there are people who would invest with the city if the city believed. So I, I think that's just an important thing to, don't, don't let your vision be tempered down by the fear that the city would foot the bill. Adam? So I think there's definitely some value in looking at what the overall goal is here, but I would think it would be problematic if the council, the future council, doesn't narrow back in once you've gone to the broader goals to come back to the relicensing question. Because I, I, I really appreciate that what you've given us today, Bjorn, because I think it's 
very helpful to understand generally what the process is. It's an understanding that I didn't previously have. But I think we need to get into, as a city, the narrow focus of how, with our ultimate goal in mind, we can be a proper function within the, the steps that we need to take in the relicensing project itself. Because I think that my answers to that question are still somewhat up in the air. I don't know what the best strategy is for the city to take in the relicensing pro process. I know that there are other regulatory authorities who are going to be involved regardless of whether or not we're involved in that process. But we need to have a very clear focus in going into that process as to what we as a city can effectuate in that process. And if we clump all these different goals together and talk about them generally, I think it's going to avoid the conversation that we need to have is what is our role in the relicensing process itself. Councilor Walker, this is in your, in your ward. Do you have anything you want to add? I didn't, I didn't hear enough of what, what was spoken here tonight, so I, I think I better wait a little while before I comment. <laughs> but I do know we, we really need to do something as the city of Auburn. We need to partner up with people that have probably a little more skills than we even have at this so that we know where we're going. Uh, I know in the past we worked a little bit with the Bates students. Uh, I would hope we're still going to do that. Uh, working, I hope, with the Anscoggin Trust and whatever else we can bring to the table. I, I think that's the big thing right now. What what do we have to bring to the table with us? And then our management, that management, working together, we probably can figure out exactly where we're going here in the next year or two and have a, have a good plan put in place. Because we don't have millions of dollars to spend. But if we partner up with people, we can probably come up with a few million dollars. You know, we've got, I mean, we've got the Conservation Commission, we've got recreational advisory committees, we've got a lot of folks, a land trust, that can put together what they think would be a, a good plan, I would think. And the City Council, obviously, our, our job is to see what the policy is that's going to help make that happen. But like I say, my concern is I don't see a clear picture of anything. I see a lot of stuff that could be, would be, possibly could be. But I'd like to just have those groups that have a real interest in and the creativity to come up with a plan, along with our economic department. I hate to have us spending hours and hours of time laboring over legal issues and spending lots of money on that. We still haven't thought about the plan economically. What does that mean? What will X do? Bring Y? Or what is X? What, what do we need to do to bring that in? That's what I'd hope our economic department would help us with. And maybe that's too simplistic, but instead of spending hours and all the time we've spent so far, we now have got to decide what are our goals and what will we achieve from that. And I think Bjorn had something he wanted to add after Eric as well. So. Uh, so, so far we've relied very heavily on our comprehensive plan and the new Auburn Master Plan. If we start to look at a much longer stretch of river and a more comprehensive plan for that, that whole corridor, um, we don't have as much to rely on right now, so that would be a good good opportunity to partner with the land trust. Um, recreational goal number one in the new Auburn master plan is, is access to our rivers. Um, we've relied heavily on that and sort of checked in periodically with a, a staff recommendation based on those existing plans um, and then modified them based on council input. But uh, uh, you, you're on. Bjorn, did you have? I just, you uh, just a quick comment. I, and, I mean, I think one thing to keep in mind is, is the city can, you know, put money at something, um, but the city brings clout. When you when you're, when you make those relationships and those partnerships with the land trusts and other folks that have um, the same goals as the city, um, you become very attractive for, for federal dollars and other resources. So I wouldn't think of this as solely a, a financial burden for the city. And, and I, I guarantee you there's going to be times when you have to come up with match and you have to do things. I have to work hard at stuff, but um, the city of Auburn is well established and brings clout to any kind of federal grant. And I think it would be very attractive for the folks who look at those grants to say, we have a land trust, we have a city, we have these other entities that are all together with a plan. Boom. Uh, even the, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, um, 
you can file a plan with them and they will post it and then you can cite it through the, the relicensing. That's one thing NOAA is in the process of doing right now is we're developing a comprehensive plan for the Androscoggin River. We're going to file that with the commission. It's going to be on the record and then we're going to cite it. Now, that's going to be all fish because that's what we do. <laughs> but the city can, can take these ideas and come together and come up with a plan. I, I think it doesn't have to be just doling out dollars to consultants. It can be, you know, let's get some money, let's do some things, let's make some money in the city. So. Well, and, and, and to that point, I think uh, several counselors kind of hit this. You know, it, I, I think there are two separate things we need to be cognizant of. And, you know, I look at uh, all the progress we've made on uh, a project like the, the New Auburn Village. You know, the, the first step to getting the pieces to fall into place was having a, a comprehensive vision of, of something we were trying to accomplish. And then, you know, we, we put ourselves in a place where we were able to leverage that vision to find opportunities. I think there's a, a set of discrete problems that are raised by the relicensing process itself that we have to, you know, we have to keep our eyes on the prize, and that's a very technical uh, set of questions and concerns. But I think more broadly, if we look at, you know, the Little Androscoggin from, you know, the, the bridge over Hotel Road down to, you know, where it meets the, the Androscoggin, I think we as a city would be remiss if we didn't start thinking about how we want to leverage that resource in a way that's that's best for the city if, if we don't have something on paper yet in terms of how we ought to be using that resource and something a vision that we want to be working toward in the context of these relicensing processes and, and whatever else we'll, we're doing along the river uh, I think th and that's something that, that stakeholders would be essential in, in pulling together and something that I think is a community process not necessarily a, uh, something that that would need to be, uh, you know, an, an internal process on, on the city's part. But I think that's that's a place that's ripe for us to build uh, more relationships and, and really kind of move something forward on a grander scale. So. Hey, I would I would agree. Just like the New Auburn plan is coming together now because, and I know it's been a long time, Leroy, but it's coming together because there was a plan. Right. I mean, that's where it starts, and and we need to have what we plan to do, and like you said, it will add clout one like he was saying uh, we need to get on that as soon as possible because uh, we're gonna want to start doing stuff but if we're still not knowing what direction we're gonna go in, it's gonna be just plopping around like a fish out of water <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I had to I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> we've uh, m most of this council has not seen we we've had meetings in the past Jonathan goes back a long ways like he said I, I sat at a couple of the meetings where we talked about licensing the bigger dam and we talked about some plans moving forward. <clears throat> it's not like we don't have people out there that have plans. There's, there's all kinds of people that have plans. It's, we've never worked together to put the plans on a piece of paper where we all agree with them and that's one thing we really need to do. We, we've got a couple committees right in house here that have been waiting years to say, we need your help, we want your help. Uh, we've had debate students come over and, and they've had some great ideas and they have some real uh, documentation that they've done over the years. So it's not like, it's not like we don't have people out there that know something. We, we have a lot of people that know a lot. Yeah. In, in, it's a matter fact, of working together. Earlier this year when, when FERC staff were up and had a there was, they did a, a, a site visit to the Lower Barker, had a meeting at the, at the Hilton. Um, you know, that, 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 that issue came up about plans. The reality is, is there a plan? Yes. Is there a prioritization within the plan and action steps? No. no right. So you, you can look at the comprehensive plan and, and what it lays, lays out along the Little Androscoggin from hotel down, everything from land use to broad visions around aesthetics and recreation. It hasn't been sort of zoomed in. And then in some areas, there was enough community interest where we did zero in. So from the upper Barker to the confluence, there has been a zero in. There have been trail connections identified, water access points, portage needs, where would you have fishing access? And now we're even at the more microscopic level of, all right, how does this process play into that? 
I, I think there may, there's a challenge, and the question is how much administrative time do you want to put Eric through to go into each of those documents, pull out their verbiage, and create for you one document. If you go to what the city's put up on the website, yeah. it's all there. And if you're willing to spend the time to get fully immersed in it, it there's, there are a lot of moving parts, and, and maybe that's a a question for do, do we make the documents more easily searchable if someone wants a certain category of information but that the Bates students did a phenomenal job a couple of years ago inventorying a lot of that work um, and staff you know have been watching this thing it's been it was a 2014 when we drove up to Pittsfield and and freezing cold and the city bus had shut down that day and I mean this has been going for this, this just this process three years let alone the new Auburn process which has been has been eight so I think that there's work to be refined but I, I think staff are to be credited for you know for an issue like this have, have been keeping a really close eye and, and positioning us well if the city had not done what it did in 2009 11 and 12 around the new Auburn neighborhood and what it was going to mean for economic development to reconnect to that river we would not be positioned to where we are right now with this license and in no, fact, I think yeah. we would have missed the opportunity. And I want to thank staff, too. I mean, I think it's a great job getting to that point, but we are now to that point where we need to know a, a specific direction. And our own committees can do it. Again, uh, the new mayor coming in may want to develop a new committee or find a way to take the existing committees and to get them to focus on this so that we have grassroots, uh, as well as the land trust and the other established organizations coming together. And then staff will take direction, maybe from them, through council, I mean, I don't think that they should take direction directly from the committee, but it should come through council to know what the next steps are. So, there, there's been a huge amount of work that's been done, and uh, I think the the important thing for us as policymakers and for the future council and for the community at large is to be able to actually craft effective policy around that work that that's being conducted. And I think that's that's one of the biggest issues we have right now is that the that work obviously is happening, has been happening, will continue to happen, but um, making sure that the, the community and the policymakers within the city have a clear sense of uh, what is happening and you know, a, a good sense of what ought to happen in the future. And I think we have the tools to do that. The pieces are there. It's just that, that unified vision that, that everyone is, is aware of and, and sold on. I think that's, you know, it's, it's not impossible to do by any means done all the hard work I think you know now it's just tying it together and getting buy-in and, and putting ourselves behind it in a way that we haven't uh, yet been able to do on on the on the policy side any final comments or thoughts from staff as we wrap up tonight's workshop no just uh, as staff appreciate the support that we've had in going through this process uh, for relicensing um, there is more work to do if you haven't looked at the city's website under rivers and hydropower uh, right now it's almost entirely focused on lower barker uh, we're about to create a section for upper barker and we'll go through the licensing process uh, for each facility as we continue to work through those uh, there's a lot of information there uh, you couldn't read it all in a week probably if you if you tried so uh, we tried to uh, give them good titles so you can pick the ones you want but the city has uh, has provided a lot of input so far. Mr. Manager, any last, last comments? Just a quick comment. Um, I just want to thank Eric for the work that he's done and the support that uh, he's received from Michael Chamings and uh, the council and the mayor. Uh, I've been impressed with how knowledgeable Eric is on a number of topics, uh, including this one. And I appreciate the comments from the all of the council members who are here and the mayor. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, I think the idea of doing partnerships makes a lot of sense. And we do need to have a goal. And we need to know what we're trying to achieve. Thank you. Before I uh, declare us adjourned, I just want to thank Bjorn for uh, making the time to come up uh, tonight uh, and be part of this conversation and the work that you're, you have done and will continue to do. And, Eric speaks speaks highly of, of, of your communications and and Kevin I know you uh, um, had intended to come up uh, I know you were up for the FERC site visit and I want to I just want to on behalf of the city thank you and uh, the National Park Service for staying actively involved you and I met 11 years ago 
on the uh, Deer Ribs and Gulf Island work, and you've continued to stay engaged uh, as we do work here in the community. So thank thank both of you. Well, I want to th thank the, the, the city of Auburn for your involvement because you know we can only do so much from the agency perspective unless the communities uh, are informed and buy into the the process and and like you have take control of the the issues that you have concern about. It's very difficult for us to come in and, and provide the you know the process technical assistance. So again, we appreciate your your long term efforts on uh, on this project and on the Andrews Coggin. Councilor Walker. Yeah, last comment. I, I really would like to see the city of Auburn and the Anascoga Land Trust really sit down and try to, to lay out something that would be uh, really great for us councilors coming in for the, the new year, that we understand how you're going to come together and, and what is it we can do to really help you so that you, you play, you know, in, this, in the same sandbox instead of one here and one there. I'd like us to be together. And I think we would have the support of the council 100% if we could do that. And, and maybe even a little more update. I, I know you've tried your best, but maybe a little bit more updates for us here at, at the council seat or, or we do a special meeting once every three months so that we have more update and it's not all around license and it's around what you do and how much you know how much you've gained especially i think as a partnership it would be more important to us as counselors because uh, it's a very important thing and and we're behind the eight ball way behind it and we should have had a lot of recreation on this river by now a lot more than we've seen in the last two years so i i agree with moving forward and trying to especially if it isn't going to take a lot of money to do it, and that doesn't sound like it take a lot of money to get together and have some plans how two or three different groups can really help us out. So thank you for everything you've done and the other people that's involved as well. We are adjourned, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. very much. Sure. Yeah, appreciate it.